Welcome back to Building Character, where we figure out how to play as your favorite fictional characters in Dungeons & Dragons. Join the Patreon for these sheets and a whole bunch more, and like and subscribe to stay within the Prime Directive next time you play. Maybe. Today we're building Captain Kirk and Mr. Spock from Star Trek, our first Star Trek characters. And here you thought you were going to have to wait until 2255 to see it, you silly goose. Haven't you been paying attention these past couple years? There's no way we're making it that long. Cruises like them dudes in red shirts off Star Trek. He Kirk, he Spock, he McCoy. Been B-boy since the judge first squeezed toys. Let's start off with the captain. Shatner always got top billing. First, we need leadership to lead the ship. It's a real enterprise keeping that crew together. Next, we need the patented Kirk fighting style with slow, steady punches. Finally, we'll be a tactical master with abilities to outmaneuver our opponents even if you're outgunned. For stats, we'll be using the standard point buy from the player's handbook. Roll for stats if you want, we're kind of making an all-arounder. Charisma will be your most remarkable ability at 15. Your pattern of speech might seem a little weird, but its unique rhythm makes it kind of iconic. Strength at 14, your bruiser fighting style doesn't have a bunch of finesse. Dexterity at 13, even future guns are still ranged weapon attacks, so you do need a bit of finesse, probably. Everything else can go to 10. Constitution, intelligence, and wisdom. You're decent at those things, but not super great at them. We'll make them better in other ways. Obviously, building Kirk, you need to manage your resources strategically. Kirk was born in Iowa, which means he's close enough to human. We'll grab the inspiring leader feed for a 10 minute speech that gives six allies temporary HP equal to your charisma modifier plus your total level. Hopefully your DM just lets you say this is part of a short rest and doesn't make you actually talk for 10 minutes. If you do, just look up one of my video scripts and read it out loud, you have my permission. Bump your dexterity and charisma with your two free points, take history for your skill of choice, and the sailor background for athletics and perception. The Federation is kind of military, but you're mostly supposed to just be boldly going places, not boldly blowing up places. You do tend to blow up a few places here and there, though. We'll kick things off as a rogue. They get a lot of skills and are the most likely class to cheat their way through school. Sorry, cleverly exploit gaps in rules their way through school. You get four skills like investigation, persuasion, intimidation, and deception, which should cover you no matter what the situation is. You also get expertise in two skills. Doubling your proficiency bonus with them, I think persuasion and perception are what I'll start with, helping you rally your friends and observe your enemies. You also get sneak attack, letting you add a d6 of damage to creatures when you have advantage on the attack roll or an ally within five feet of them. Sulu tends to rock a sword, so if he's in close, your laser is going to hit harder. It's not cheap. It's strategy. Second level rogues can make a tactical retreat with cunning action, letting you dash, disengage, or hide as a bonus action. It isn't always the best idea to fight people, especially when they're genetically engineered superhumans. Third level rogues can choose a roguish archetype. Masterminds are masters of tactics, letting you help as a bonus action with a range of 30 feet to give your allies some advantages with literal advantage. You also get disguise kits, forgery kits, and a set of gaming tools to be proficient with. It's good to know that even in the future, we're still going to have gamers. Your sneak attack bumps up to 2d6 here as well. Fourth level rogue skin ability score improvement or a feat. We'll stick with investing in charisma for now. I know it's not as helpful in combat, but Star Trek is really more of a role-playing show than a combat show. Still, we're going to jump over to fighter for a fighting style like unarmed fighting to fight unarmed, letting you deal a 1d6 with your unarmed attacks, 1d8 if you put two hands together for a big old chop, and a d4 of damage to a creature you have grappled once per round. The big double hand chop is obviously the most in-character fighting style for you. You also get second wind, letting you recover 1d10 plus your fighter level as a bonus action once per short rest, so run away one turn, take a deep breath the next. Second level fighters get action surge, letting you make two actions in one turn once per short rest. Keep in mind you can only sneak attack once per turn, so maybe use your second action for something other than attacking. Just blasting away is so Star Wars, this is the thinking person's sci-fi series. This or Dune, but I'm not doing any Dune stuff until all the movies are done. I'm not gonna just like, flip through the pages of a book for the background of stuff. That wouldn't work. Third level fighters can choose a martial archetype, and battle masters are pretty good at bossing people around. You get four d8 superiority die you can spend on three maneuvers. Rally gives a creature your superiority die plus your charisma modifier in temporary HP as a bonus action. Keep in mind, temporary HP doesn't stack, so use it after your inspiring leader wears off, or if your landing party has more than six members. Commander Strike lets you command a creature to make an attack with their reaction using your bonus action and they get to add a superiority die to the damage. It's kind of wild that we're basically building a character whose goal is to not do any fighting himself. Maneuvering attack is the most maneuvery maneuver, letting a friendly creature use its reaction to move without provoking opportunity attacks and you get to add your superiority die to the damage of your attack. It's a punch with a little get out of here shout at the same time. 
Multitasking is almost as cool as multi-classing. But the coolest thing you can grab is a set of artisan's tools as a student of war, like calligraphy, to have the power of a god. But what would a god need with a starship? Fourth level fighters get another ability score improvement, cap off your charisma modifier for inspiring leader speeches that give people 9 temporary HP for free, a total of 54 if you get it on all 6 people. That's basically an extra crewmate's worth of HP for the bad guys to deal with. Fifth level fighters get an extra attack, letting you make 2 attacks instead of 1 with your action, or up to 4 with an action surge. Your damage might still be a little low, and your hits might not be all that accurate, but, uh, well nothing, there's no but. We need more strength. Sixth level fighters get another ability score improvement, start working on your strength to handle things when you don't have your friends around. Obviously it's better to have your friends around, but you're not exactly a slouch yourself. Seventh level battle masters get another superiority die and two more maneuvers. Pushing attack will be a nice drop kick, forcing a strength saving throw on a creature you attack, pushing them back 15 feet if they fail. Tripping attack forces a strength saving throw on a creature, failing that they're knocked prone. Both of these add your superiority die to the damage and should make you a bit more formidable when you're alone. But the real benefit here is know your enemy, letting you determine a creature's strength, dexterity, constitution, HP, AC, fighter levels, or total levels after a minute of study. You get two pieces of information and know if they're better than, worse than, or equal to you. Just stall them out on the comms for a bit and you can know who you're fighting before you have to fight them. Eighth level fighters get another ability score improvement. This time go for dexterity to be better at aiming your laser. That's probably a better option with sneak attack than punching people. Speaking of, let's go to the fifth level of rogue for 3d6 sneak attack damage and uncanny dodge, letting you take half damage as a reaction when you can see the source of damage. We won't be able to invest in constitution as much as I'd like, so this will make up for it and give you a bit more tenacity. Six level rogues get expertise in two more skills. Deception and investigation will be my picks this time, helping you bluff and study people with a bit more intention than you would with perception. Seventh level rogues get evasion, letting you take half damage on failed dexterity saves and no damage on successful ones. Just because sparks are flying and the ship is shaking doesn't mean you need to quite worry just yet. You also get 46 sneak attack damage here. Eighth level rogues get another ability score improvement. It's strength's turn this time. We'll just kind of bounce back and forth between that and dexterity since your skill proficiencies will make you plenty good with your intelligence and wisdom skills and uncanny dodge can help keep that damage off for your constitution. Ninth level mastermind rogues get insightful manipulator, which is like know your enemy, but for intelligence, wisdom, and charisma scores or class levels. Since it's just a minute of interaction with both of them, you can do both at the same time, having an in-character reason to metagame. If Kirk played D&D, he'd metagame. That's how you beat the Kobayashi Maru, baby. You also get 5d6 sneak attack damage. That might help you beat the Kobayashi Maru as well, if you need to like sneak up on a test. 10th level rogues get another ability score improvement. Dexterity this time. The laser is going to be much more useful, but people take it from you a lot, so we can't just ignore strength. 11th level rogues get reliable talent, meaning the lowest you can roll on a skill check you're proficient with is a 10, and you still get to add your modifiers. That means a minimum of 27 persuasion and deception checks, 22 for investigation and perception, 21 for intimidation, 20 for athletics, and 16 for history. I just ran the numbers, and I like the way they look. I also like 6d6 sneak attack damage. I'm guessing you're going to like that too. Our capstone is the 12th level of Rogue for one last ability score improvement. Rather than picking between strength or dexterity, I'm grabbing the tough feat, giving you an extra 40 HP at this point to survive in harsh alien worlds. Now that we've hit level 20, let's figure out how viable this build is. First, you have massive charisma skills that pretty much can't fail. You're also great at supporting your team with 150 temporary HP to distribute at the end of your short rests, help as a bonus action, and maneuvers to make the squad better. Finally, you can metagame, figuring out your foe's strengths and weaknesses to develop a better strategy. For weaknesses, you're a fighter rogue multiclass without a capped physical skill, so your damage is going to be a little mediocre. Your saving throws could be an issue with constitution and wisdom being particularly common and particularly nasty saving throws as well. Finally, you technically don't have any magical damage even though your DM is probably going to give you a magical weapon for a laser pistol. Still, you might want to find someone with abilities that are a bit beyond human. Thankfully, you're great at assessing other people's skills, so you should be able to find a first mate that rounds off your weaknesses. Something wrong. Kink in my back. That's it. A little, little higher, please. Push. Push hard. Take it in there, Mr. Sp <laughs> Let's start off with our goals for this build. First, we need Vulcan physiology, meaning compared to a human will be bigger, faster, and stronger, too. You're the first officer of the Enterprise crew. Next, we'll get Nex, with a little pinch that stops people from moving. Finally, we need to put our heads together. I'm talking about a melding of the minds here, folks. For stats, we'll be using the standard point array from the player's handbook roll for stats if you want, just keep your multi-classing minimums in mind. Intelligence will be number one. You're the science officer, you need to know the science. Wisdom next, insight and medicine are both on that list, and you're pretty good at sensing how other people feel, talking to them about it, 
Yeah, we'll get there. Strength after that. Vulcans are better at lifting things than humans, but don't let Kirk put you in the cargo bay. Follow that up with dexterity. As good as you are at punching, lasers are pretty good. Constitution is a bit low, you don't actually have to brawl all that often, but we'll dump charisma. Just because you have super empathy doesn't mean you're great at talking. See? I told you we'd get there. Spock is a half Vulcan, and Vulcan are Star Trek elves, so Spock is a half elf. That'll give you plus two wisdom and plus one to your strength and intelligence modifier. The player's handbook half elf has plus two charisma instead of wisdom, but Tasha's gave me permission to change it. If you don't like that, get a job at Wizards of the Coast and publish a book, you dingus. You also get 60 feet of dark vision, fey ancestry for advantage on saves against being charmed, and you can't be put to sleep with magic. Call it a little Vulcan willpower. Half elves get two free skills in addition to the two skills from your background. Get athletics, investigation, medicine, and perception however you want. Technically, you went to the same school Kirk did, so you could go for the sailor background if you want. I'm not too picky about backgrounds either. I'm kind of loosey-goosey if you haven't noticed. These bills are more like guidelines for you to make your own stuff than actual hard, fast rules you have to stick to. I can't arrest you if you change something. We'll kick things off as a wizard to grab two skills from the wizard list, like insight and history to put your big brain to use. Or you can put it to use with spells and cantrips, like message to whisper to a creature 120 feet away, and even let them whisper back to you for some communication with the party on the Enterprise. Light creates light for your crewmates with bad human eyes, and True Strike will let you remind your audience that Star Trek was saved by a bunch of Trekkie women, so gatekeeping the fandom for dudes is even more ridiculous than it normally is. It also gives you advantage on a weapon attack next round, but that's bad, just attack twice. For your first level spells, we'll grab the Physical Suite, Long Strider, Jump, and Expeditious Retreat, adding 10 feet to your movement speed, tripling your jump distance, and letting you dash as a bonus action in that order. We won't be going into Monk, I know that might seem surprising, but I'll explain it more later when we get there. These are going to round off that Monk physicality. Charm Person forces a Wisdom saving throw on a creature, failing that they're charmed by you for a minute. This isn't really mind control, it's advantage on charisma checks. Keep that in mind. Identify will let you know about new alien technology when you find it, when you're boldly going. Finally, Mage Armor will make your AC 13 plus your Dexterity modifier when you're not wearing armor, so you can sail through the galaxy in a cool blue shirt without worrying about dying. Second level wizards can choose a school. Enchantment wizards get a hypnotic gaze, letting you force a wisdom saving throw on creatures within five feet of you, incapacitating and charming them if they fail. You can repeat this over and over again to really get on your enemy's nerves. Get it? Nerves? This should be a useful technique in a pinch. You also get two more spells as a wizard. Comprehend Languages lets you understand all spoken and written languages for a translator, and Chromatic Orb fires a phaser that deals 3d8 acid, cold fire, lightning, thunder, or poison damage. I'm not totally sure what type of damage a phaser should be. I weirdly want to say thunder for some reason. Third level wizards can learn second level spells. Hold Person is an upgraded nerve pinch, forcing a wisdom saving throw on a humanoid, paralyzing them for a minute if they fail, either letting your team get away or get in a bunch of critical hits. Detect Thoughts is an upgraded mind meld, letting you read surface level thoughts of a creature and probe deeper if they fail a wisdom saving throw. Things always get better when you put your heads together. Fourth level wizards get an ability score improvement, will bump your intelligence first, since your Vulcan stuff is probably the best bet for resolving conflicts without violence, which is kind of the main goal of the Enterprise crew. For this level spell, enhance ability gives someone advantage on skill checks of a certain type. If you choose strength, their carrying capacity is also doubled. If you choose dexterity, they don't take falling damage from heights of 20 feet or less, and if you choose constitution, they get 2d6 temporary HP. Vulcans are just sort of better at everything, now you can do that for an hour, depending on your concentration. Magic Weapon makes a weapon magical in terms of overcoming resistances, and adds one to the attack and damage rolls. Phasers can blast through all sorts of stuff. I know I said that phasers were chromatic orb earlier in this build, but in the Kirk section, kinda called them weapons. Uh, you know, Spock doesn't have weapon proficiency yet, so we'll call him Chromatic Orb. Until we go to the first level of fighter and get proficiency with all weapons, hooray! You can also grab a fighting style, like unarmed fighting, which doesn't use weapons, but instead lets you make unarmed attacks that deal 1d6 bludgeoning damage or 1d8 with two free hands, and you can deal 1d4 damage to a creature you have grappled once per round. You can't really get any benefits from a magic weapon with this, but it's always there, even if the aliens take your phasers away. You also get Second Wind, letting you heal 1d10, plus your fighter level as a bonus action once per short rest. That should give you a bit of Vulcan vitality. Second level fighters get Action Surge to make two actions in one turn once per short rest, letting you Nerve Pinch and dash away right away, or do any other number of things. Spock's pretty good at reading the situation, I'm gonna count on you to figure out what you need to do. Third level fighters can get really good at reading a situation if you choose the Samurai Martial Archetype, giving you Fighting Spirit. That'll give you 5 temporary HP and advantage on all your attack rolls until the end of your next turn. To fight with either the passion of a human or the focus of a Vulcan, you can choose to roleplay it however you want. However you like to do it, you get 3 uses per long rest. 
You also get another skill proficiency like persuasion. After spending a bit of time with Kirk, you do get a little bit better at talking to people. We'll actually get even more of that later. Fourth level fighters get another ability score improvement. Cap off your intelligence modifier to maximize the power of your analytical mind. Fifth level fighters get an extra attack, letting you make two attacks instead of one with your action or up to four with an action surge. Four punches in one round seems a little fast for Star Trek sensibilities, but the Western fight choreography in the 70s was just kind of slow like that. I mean, watch the lightsaber fight in A New Hope. It's, uh... It's steady. Six level fighters get another ability score improvement. Bump your wisdom score here for better persuasion checks. Wait, why would wisdom help with persuasion checks? That's because seventh level samurai are elegant courtiers, letting you add your wisdom modifier to your persuasion checks and giving you proficiency with charisma saving throws. It's supposed to be wisdom, but you already had that from wizard. You could also choose intelligence if you didn't also already have that from wizard. Now you have proficiency with saving throws for all the soft stats. That's some real resolve. Eight level fighters get another ability score improvement cap off your wisdom modifier for ultimate mental defenses and insight so high you can basically mind meld without casting a spell. Ninth level fighters get indomitable, letting you reroll a failed saving throw once per long rest. Probably use it for one of your soft stats, though your physical stats aren't really that bad. You could use it for those too. 10th level samurai get tireless spirit, giving you one use of your fighting spirit when you roll initiative with zero. Considering we built a fighter and didn't really invest in your physical stats, it's probably going to be nice to have advantage on some attack rolls. Your fighting spirit also gives you 10 temporary HP here instead of 5. 11th level fighters get another extra attack for 3 attacks per round, obviously you need to be faster and stronger than Kirk. Which is why at the 12th level of fighter we'll use our ability score improvement to bump our strength so we can hold our own against genetically engineered super soldier monster men. 13th level fighters get another use of indomitable, which does work on death saving throws that's worth pointing out. It would be really nice if the crew didn't have to go searching for you. 14th level fighters get another ability score improvement, bump up your strength to be on par with Kirk. Even though ideally, you should be stronger, I guess that's what enhance ability is for. Or maybe your extra strength translates into more rapid strikes, especially with the 15th level of Samurai, which gives you rapid strikes. That means that once per round when you have advantage on a weapon attack, you can attack normally, but with two attacks instead of one. This is the anti-true strike and pairs pretty well with Fighting Spirit, which will also give you 15 temporary HP at this point. Our capstone is the 16th level of Fighter. For one last ability score improvement, cap off your strength so you can fight harder and faster than your commanding officer. Kirk's best fighting style is tell Spock to do it. Now that we've hit level 20, let's figure out how viable this build is. First, you're remarkably consistent with three capped stats and fighting abilities without weapons, so you're set for any situation. You also have great ways to kick people out of the fight with hold person and hypnotic gaze to keep your foes busy. Finally, you've got ways to reroll failed saving throws and three saving throw proficiencies to make sure you're safe. For weaknesses, you have a very limited number of spells. The mind meld can be a very tiring thing after all. You also don't have constitution saving throw proficiency, so your concentration isn't all that great. Finally, almost all of your best spells use concentration, so you can only have one up at a time and switching them will expend your very limited spell slots. So basically, all your cons are cons, but that means that you've also got a lot of pros. Have Kirk bring the charm and Spock bring the everything else. With a team like that, I'm sure there isn't a con that could break those pros. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, subscribe for more. We're making double videos every day this month. Join the Patreon for these sheets and a whole bunch more, and sub to Tulak and Mango for more Tulak fun.